MaximumFun.org. So it's such an honor to be here. It's such a great energy here. Um, and I know Jesse from way back. I think we first met online around 99 or 2000. We were both charter members of the OK Player message board, um, if anyone's familiar. Um, I, th I feel like that's one of the secret cultural engines of the internet. Um, and that was one of my first experiences in an online form of the power and the value of creative communities, sort of uh, spaces that you build around a shared passion, either as the creator or the person who receives and supports that creation, um, which I feel like all of us being here is just a, a wonderful example of. And I have a big jumble of notes here. I've been inspired by a lot of things going on here. And I, I'm going to try to talk about uh, my experiences uh, with hip hop, my lifelong relationship with hip hop as a creative community, and uh, what I've learned from that relationship in terms of the power and the value of uh, having a community where we can make those connections with each other. Um, and the lessons I've taken with me about the responsibility that comes with being a participant in a community that you're trying to keep healthy and creative and a representative to the world of that community. Um, which are, I mean, it's those, those lessons that I take from being a representative and a participant in hip hop is what informs all of the work I do now talking on other social issues or whatever else I'm ranting about. Uh, for those who might not be familiar, I do a video blog named Ill Doctrine, which is basically, <laughs> it's, a, it's a video series where I just, I get really mad and yell at people about being kind to each other. Um, <laughs> And it's, it covers, I started out originally talking about hip hop issues and I've sort of veered more and more towards other social issues. Most of my, I think, best known work, a lot of it is around the topic of race, um, like Jesse said. I don't, I don't think I'm gonna talk about race too much tonight uh, or today uh, because, uh, mostly because the latest news is just so far through the looking glass, I've basically, <laughs> I've got nothing. This woman in Washington, I don't really, I have no, I've got nothing for you. I mean, I will say uh, she's making life hard for the rest of us actually light-skinned black people right now. Um, there's, I'm at, there's actually a guy on Twitter demanding to see my birth certificate right now. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. And I also want, one of the things I've sort of become best known for randomly is being falsely accused of pretending to be black. <laughs> so I feel like this woman, she's kind of diluting my market share with this thing she's doing now. But I don't know, I mean, she seems like she has issues. That's why I feel like I get the jokes, but I kind of feel bad for her. I don't want to spend too much time clowning her. Uh, but anyway, so I try, I try to sort of take whatever injustice is making me yell at the screen at home and just take a few hours crystallizing that and just uh, crushing it into some sort of uh, message that people can use as a piece of ammunition when we're all having these same arguments online. And there's sort of, there's a standard mythology about hip hop that its birth was inspired by a need to speak truth to power uh, or the, and that the, the essential value of hip hop is in its um, sort of explicit political agency, but that's really not where hip hop origins lie at all. It was in needing a space where you could go and party, like a, a space where you could put on your best clothes, do your best dances, spin the best music, like a place where your creativity and style and joy and yourself could be recognized. And that sort of collective experience of carving out a space for creative community is what uh, made their collective voice so loud that the world's most invisible people eventually had the whole world watching. And then, you know, the whole world co-opted it and ruined it. Um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll leave that part uh, for another time. And that's been the, uh, that's the blueprint that hip hop has created that gets replicated around the world in the favelas in Brazil, you know, in all, all the countries where the Arab Spring started. And, not, I mean, and again, it's not necessarily about being directly political, but it gives you that space just to make a connection either through your creation or your appreciation of, the, of that, of, uh, your appreciation of that creation, the connection that you make with each other around uh, creative endeavors. And that is what hip hop did for me on a personal level from a really early age. I was a really uh, painfully introverted, isolated kid. And uh, you know, I grew up in a family with a lot of uh, mental illness, depression, addiction. Um, so I learned from an early age just 
how specifically I think um, audio, like whether it's music or radio, and I think podcasting can play a similar role, like it sort of allows you to make a really intimate connection that other forms don't, um, just sort of being alone with these voices or with the music and listening to it. So, you know, I used to come home to, on my dad's side of the family, a home environment. It was really turbulent, and the stereo system was right by the front door, and I'd just come right to the stereo and put the headphones on and just escape into that world and just be with... There was only hip-hop on the radio Fridays and Saturdays from 9 p.m. to midnight at that time, So, and I had no social life at that age anyway, so it was easy for me to block out that time, so I would religiously come home and listen, and it would just help me escape the circumstances and feel connected, even though I was doing it in solitude. I felt this really deep connection with these people, like this, my generation of young people in New York doing this thing that I think is really powerful, and I think there's a special passion and sort of a special bond that you build when you are part of a community or supporter of a community that's built around a form that 99% of the rest of the world does not respect or understand at all, um, which was the case for hip hop until a lot more recently than, than people realize. If you've ever seen Patton Oswalt talk about what it's like to be a, a fully grown adult who's in the comic books, trying to explain that to someone, and, and I'm sure a lot of us have had to say like that's that's my life today as a, a video blogger, <laughs> trying to explain to people what I do. You know, I'm sure a few of you were telling your family you're coming to Max Fun Con, and you say, oh, well, that's, well, what, what is that? And what, what's a podcast? And you say, oh, but never mind. But you're going to get here <laughs> to your people and share that. And there's a special, like, there's a passion you have for supporting that form and that community and, and a bond I think you have with the people um, that you're sharing it with. And that's, and that's especially for the hip-hop scene in the 90s, you know, I was blessed to be able to help build that underground scene. And um, there's a kinship you have, it's just like, those are my people. Um, so that was a gift that hip-hop gave me to save my life many times over. First in that solitary form of just getting to connect with the music and the art and the voices, and then I was blessed uh, when I was very young. I was a senior in high school when I got to start my radio show and really become a part of this creative community and support it and represent it, get to meet all my idols and relate to them as peers. Basically everything good that has come to me has come from my relationship with that creative community and I've tried to commit myself to in all my public work now when I'm uh, speaking on whatever other issues represent those hip hop principles that I came up with and you know and that gave me a place, that gave me a voice of uh, trying to recognize um, those voices, you know, recognize those, those people who feel like they don't belong here um, and sort of building connection through creativity that lets, all, lets us all be here together. And once I got to do that, I started learning really quickly there are responsibilities that come with that, especially once you have a more prominent public voice and you get to represent the community. And the first one, which I think is painfully obvious, but I think it's one that people need to be reminded of and that it's not as easy to learn now that everyone has a public voice. It's just that everyone that you talk about with your public voice is a real person, which in the early 90s, if you were doing a hip hop radio show, you would learn that really quickly because this is a real life flesh and blood community where people you talk about would hear it. <laughs> um, and I learned, I can remember the particular instance, um, it, it was probably 92 or 93, um, we were playing a tape recording of a, a Boogie Down Productions concert. Uh, Karis One was a famous rapper back in my day. Um, <laughs> they were doing a live show in Japan, um, and of course, Karis was amazing. Then the other crew members came on, and uh, his wife was also rapping with them at that time, uh, Miss Melody, who uh, she's passed on since then, so I feel even worse about the next part of the story. She, she was not rapping that well on this occasion, so my friends and I did something we would never, I would never do this now, and we cut off the tape and started kind of clowning Miss Melody for being whack on the mic. We got a lot of yucks out of it. So you can probably tell where this story is going. A week later, I get to be backstage at the Apollo, and I'm meeting all these people, and uh, KRS-One's brother, Kenny Parker, and his other crew member, Willie D, come over. And to flesh out the picture, Kenny Parker's like 6'5", 300 pounds. So he's looking down. <laughs> so I get introduced, um, and then Kenny turns to Willie D and says, oh, Jay Smooth, this is the guy I was telling you about that was talking about Melody 
on the radio. <laughs> so I was standing there thinking, I'm, I'm going to die <laughs> backstage at the Apollo. It's kind of a cinematic way to go, I guess I can deal with that. And he, and he like, there was no threat at all. But Kenny Parker is the nicest guy in the world, but I still felt like I was just going to spontaneously combust from the shame of it. And then Kenny and Willie started cracking up and said, yeah, you're right, she was terrible that night. So I got a reprieve on that night, but um, I took that lesson with me from then on that you should never say anything about anyone with your public voice that you wouldn't be comfortable saying to Kenny Parker backstage at the Apollo. <laughs> Which I feel like that, that sort of Kenny Parker backstage at the Apollo lesson is something you can be online with a public voice for years and it'll never really connect. I mean, people still believe in this myth that the internet is not real life, which to me is the biggest lie that's ever been told. Um, so that, that was a lesson I try to take with me, you know, in the work I'm doing now online. And then the other lesson I've had to learn over the years is that if you're gonna be a part of a creative community over the span of your life, the community might not always grow old gracefully with you in every way. And uh, you know, I mean, hip hop, over the years has come to replicate some of the forms of exclusion that it started out as a refuge from. I mean, you know, replicating the same American patterns of uh, misogyny and homophobia. And I think it's important to understand that in the context of it being an endemic problem in American society and not a hip hop thing, but I also don't think we should use that as a cop out either. I think whatever your community is, you should set the bar higher than we can be equally fucked up as the rest of America. <laughs> like that's, you know, I think you should care first and foremost about what's in your backyard and try to set a high standard. Um, so as an adult who uh, wants to be a thoughtful citizen of the world and still represent hip hop, you know, because it's given so much to me, I'm never gonna turn my back on it. I'm always gonna try to represent it how I lived it. In order to keep doing that, you've gotta learn how to challenge people who are doing things that you hate. Um, in a way that still honors your human connection with them and your shared connection with them uh, through this uh, cultural bond that you have and you know, just your common connection as human beings. Um, so that, that sort of adult hip hopper's tightrope walk of uh, finding ways to call people out with compassion has been uh, the biggest principle that I try to take with me when we talk about all these other issues that we're constantly debating online. But yeah, I mean, so I've tried to apply that to discussions of race, gender, class, where it can be really tempting to just sort of entrench in your side and uh, take your disagreement as a reason to detach from the other side's humanity. And I don't mean to make false equivalencies. I mean, I think if you're on the less privileged side that traditionally hasn't had a voice, I think there's a different context to you going a little overboard compared to someone who's always been in the category that has a voice. Um, but I think whenever there's the opportunity, I mean, I think especially if you're someone who's been historically marginalized or disenfranchised, there are gonna be times when you need to just tell somebody off and get the catharsis of telling somebody off. You need to set boundaries and let people know, um, no matter what you think, whether you understand why or not, I can't tolerate you treating me this way. So I, I think uh, there's a place for that. There's a place for choosing not to engage at all. But I think when you feel up to it and when the space allows for it, I think it's really valuable to seek that sort of common ground engagement where you speak as honestly as you can about what you think someone is fucking up on, um, but do it in a way that honors their humanity and sort of tries to bring them closer to you. But that, I mean, that sort of balancing act of uh, Figuring out how to call people out with compassion has become, as, as Jesse said, a hot topic that's sort of uh, inspired a lot of hot takes lately. Someone on my Facebook wall said, uh, you know, I think uh, this new landscape we have where there are so many more voices is great, uh, but these Twitter mobs are a bug, not a feature. Um, and I, I gotta say, I disagree with that. I think the Twitter mobs are awesome for the most part, but they're, they're a feature that's still in beta. I mean, there, man, all these lines have such uh, subtext now. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, yeah, well, let's look at this video, then I'll come back. 
One of my favorite things about hip hop is our everlasting love of language. One of my least favorite things about hip hop is our everlasting fear of being gay. So I guess I shouldn't be surprised that one of our favorite slang terms combines our tremendous passion for wordplay with our tremendous insecurity about sexuality. The no homo phenomenon is an old thing, a sad old thing, but it's still a new thing to a lot of old people. So as a public service, I will now present a brief history of no homo. The phrase no homo, which traces back to an earlier slang word, pause, is a defense mechanism utilized by young men who are not only afraid of being gay or looking gay, they're actually afraid that the words they speak might sound linguistically gay. It's basically when someone says something that could be even vaguely construed as homoerotic or homosexual, someone will put no homo either before or after the phrase. No Homo was first popularized by New York's Dipset crew, led by the rapper Cameron, who was known for being clever with words and also for wearing a lot of pink, and wanted to be absolutely certain that nobody inferred anything from that. And since Dipset's fan base is made up largely of hip hop bloggers like myself, who also tend to love playing with words while feeling insecure about our geekiness, the blog world quickly fell in love with No Homo and turned it into a never ending contest to see who could use it the most often and in the most outlandish ways. And at this point, a lot of people who didn't intend to be homophobic were still attracted to the comedic device and the absurdity of it, and they felt like they could use no homo without being anti-gay. This is a juvenile game we play. It's no disrespect to anybody at all. It's so absurd and stupid that it's mad funny. And some people argue that when they take it to such a silly extreme, they're really critiquing and satirizing homophobia instead of promoting it. So the question is, how do you decide when, if ever, it's okay to play the no homo game? Me personally, I've always been in the anti-no homo camp and felt like it was offensive no matter how you said it. But even I have to admit that whenever I have a conversation about it, I always get tempted to start playing the game even when I'm in the middle of rejecting and denouncing it. And I tell myself that I'm only saying it to make fun of people who really say it, and I'm with my friends, and I know that they know that I don't mean it like that, so it's just harmless fun. But then once you start, it gets really hard to stop, and you find yourself saying it every 10 seconds for the rest of the night, and you don't really remember why you started saying it, and even though you tell yourself that you can stop any time, the truth is you are now a no homo addict. Don't let this happen to you. I'm not gonna say that nobody should ever say it. Because just like with any other word, you really gotta judge on a case-by-case -case basis. But as a general rule, if you're not the original target of an insult, you can't be the one to reclaim it. And nine times out of ten, if you're not sure whether you should use it, you probably shouldn't. Plus, it's like five years old and it's kind of played out. So if you never heard of No Homo before you saw this video, just forget I brought it up. Forget that it came out of my mouth. I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> Thank you and good night. <laughs> oh, oh, is it going to do the YouTube autoplay? <laughs> it's the worst. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, that's one of my videos. Um, and I, I did, that's also, that's something that Current TV, their producers asked me to do, and I didn't want to do it because I felt like No Homo at that time was just old news, and it turned out to be one of the ones I've done that got the biggest response. So it was a lesson to me of how your perspective and experiences that seem mundane to you could still have a lot of value um, for other people. Um, and it's also an example of me trying to sort of tread that line of talking about something I think is really ridiculous and messed up, but acknowledging the humanity on the other side. Like, I get it, I get why it's funny, I get why you get caught up in it but we should care about how the stuff we're putting out there connects with other people. Um, and I think figuring out how to transmit that message is something we have so much more opportunity to do now. Um, I mean, there's, we have so much of a broader conversation. You know, I grew up having yelling at the TV in a futile rage be the only outlet I had. You know, there was a, this finite group of people from certain demographics that had a huge public voice and the rest of us just had to sit there and take it. Now, so many people in constituencies that never had a voice are able to say how these connections that used to be one way are affecting them. And I think it's made all of our culture so much richer and stronger and more humane. I think there's also been some excess. I think we've been using those tools, figuring out the best way to use them. I think um, when you historically have been marginalized and silenced and you had to turn your voice up to 11 in order to be heard, sometimes when you have these new tools, you're gonna instinctively turn things up to 11 when maybe you didn't need to. You know, I think the pendulum has swung pretty far in the direction of being mindful of our language in ways that are 
almost always really vitally important. I think there are times that it goes overboard. I feel like for every time there might be some annoyance at some sort of uh, cumbersome uh, rhetorical guideline, uh, that's, that annoyance by far pales in comparison to the effect um, every day on people who are just belittled or erased or made invisible by us using language carelessly or unknowingly use it in, using it in ways that's harmful to them. Like that's, as Jesse said, there's growing pains, but we need to be looking at the growing pains in the context of the growth, and the growth is by such a wide margin uh, worth the growing pains, which I think are just going to keep settling themselves out. And there's been so many times, there was a, a video where I was talking about watching something on Fox News, and uh, you know, I said it was so ridiculous that, that it gave me a seizure. And then someone who suffered from epilepsy wrote in the comments, you know, as, as someone who suffers from that condition, like it, it kind of hurts when you make light of it in that way. And I went through every stage of defensiveness that you see everyone go through <laughs> when they get called out. I, was, I went through all five stages of grief for my ego. <laughs> went through how, which, so, but, but you know, this is about me. Did you, you know me? How could you think? But you, and it's, uh, but I took a deep breath and let all the stages of ego grief wash over me before I replied. <laughs> and then I said, well, you know what? You're right. Like that's, I've never had that experience. I shouldn't really be using it so cavalierly for a joke that wasn't even that good in the first place. And there's been so many times that if I could summon up the willingness to listen with humility, um, you know, I, I came out better and more humane and probably able to be funnier um, because I was open to getting that feedback. And that doesn't mean blindly or just uh, uncritically accepting any criticism that you get. But at the very least, I think you got to be able to listen with humility and just consider how your connection is affecting other people. Because whenever you create something, on some level you're hoping to have some sort of needs met by that effort. It's usually in the form of some kind of affirmation or validation from other human beings that connect with it. And I'd venture to say that if your creative endeavor is trying to make other people laugh, it stands to reason that you really probably are hoping to get affirmation and validation from other people by the connection uh, that you make. So if you're taking part in that endeavor for uh, what the connection gives to you and not caring about what the connection does for the people on the other side, you're just like you're being an asshole then. That's just not, that's not justifiable. Like we're, we're all doing this because we want to make a connection. That's what art and creative expression is about. So it's always worth treating that connection like it matters. It matters to us. That's why we're doing it. And it matters just as much to the people who receive it and engage with it and make it worthwhile for us. So it just, it just doesn't make sense to care about the connection on one end and not the other. Um, and I think you know, being here is a perfect testament to how valuable it is uh, to treat that connection like it matters and how it can nourish all of us and bring us together. And I was, there's one more story I want to tell. I don't usually talk about um, personal stuff, but since this, this feels like a safe space and you guys are all so cool. There's, I was going to show a picture, I put it up on my Facebook um, a couple of months ago of uh, uh, my dad and I. Uh, my dad got an award at the high school he used to work at. Um, and to give the backstory, like my dad, um, he's a really kind, creative, brilliant dude. He was a poet. Um, he worked for many years um, at a school in New York named Friends Seminary. It's like a Quaker school. It's kind of one of the elite private schools. Um, and he worked there uh, as the receptionist, but also became the sort of a de facto mentor for all the students of color there, which goes to show how underserved people of color are historically <laughs> at these elite schools, that the receptionist became their mentor. Um, but he played that role for from about 78 to 95. He was there. And eventually, he did it so much that uh, he got an official position there and started running an organization within the school. Um, but he also, he was sick. Um, he had a lot of demons, um, depression and addiction. Um, and he, I mean, for a long while, I think was able to, uh, I mean, he's someone who, instead of external forces making him feel like he didn't belong here, he had forces internally that were making him feel like he didn't belong here. and then you know, compounded with being a black man in America. Those are working in conjunction. Um, so I think he was able to 
find a place for himself by being at the school, helping those kids sort of find a place to belong and be of service. But eventually his, uh, his demons caught up with him and he lost the job and we were out of touch for many years. Um, so I've always sort of had my dad as an inspiration because he never really got to shine and be present the way that he should have. So, and I feel like this, it's so hard to tell what allows some people to escape and some people not to. If you've ever seen the documentary about Robert Crumb that came out in the 90s, if anyone has seen that, there's Robert Crumb and then there's his brother and that's like Crumb's family is basically like the white version of my family. That's one of the reasons I appreciate it. But Robert Crumb's brother is, seems every bit as talented as Robert Crumb. But somehow, I don't know if it's just a certain thing he lacked within him or the, call, the cards just don't fall a certain way, but he just wasn't able to escape. Robert Crumb was able to escape and transcend and his brother got consumed by it. And you know, I, I don't know if it's possible to figure out what the difference is and how we can save everyone, um, but I feel like those of us who are able to escape and transcend, uh, like we need to use that voice to represent those who weren't able to shine and to carve out space for people who are out there feeling the same way as much as we can use our voice to make connections with those people. And that's been an inspiration for me doing it for my dad. And so I, he was out of touch with me for about 15 years. He's come back around in the last few years. He's clean and sober. And someone, I think one of his poetry uh, mentees, Willie Perdomo, who's a great poet, I think pulled some strings for him to get an award at the homecoming this year at, his, uh, at the high school friend seminary. Um, so I went back there with him, the family went to get him received this sort of faculty emeritus award. So it was this teacher who was there in 1915 and this guy like, who was the receptionist in the 70s and 80s uh, getting this award. Um, so it was, it was fraught with a lot of emotion because I used to be there as a kid and you know my dad and I were both deeply unhappy in our own ways. So I get to come back, come back there and see him get this award. And he makes a great speech and does something that's amazing to me, which is uh, he uses his acceptance speech to model everything that I try to do with my public work, which is gently introduce a challenge into the conversation. He told these stories about the experience of students of color in 78 when he came in there, you know, seeing a group of black kids at the table and um, going over there. And then the kids looked up and said, what, you want to come talk to us? And he said, oh, yeah, what do you mean? And they said, well, nobody else does. So we started telling stories like this, which you could tell the current principal had no intention of this being what the occasion was for. <laughs> but he did, it in a, he did it in a gentle way and just put that on the table, then accepted his award. And then if you're familiar with Quaker tradition, you have these meetings where it's like a meditative thing where you sit in silence. And then if you're moved to speak, you can stand up and speak, but you're mostly just sitting there in silence. So an amazing thing happened where after about 10 minutes of us sitting there, black and Latino alumni started standing up and sharing their stories of what it was like going to friends, you know, what the support they did get, how it felt, how things have changed over the years. And it just became this amazing sort of microcosmic embodiment of everything that I hope to be doing with uh, what I put out there, just like sort of putting that energy out there and setting an example and hoping that it opens up space for other people to speak and feel that community. Um, so it, it was just, it was a powerful moment of just feeling so glad that we were like, we're both here, we both made it. And uh, you know, we've made it here by finding outlets where we can try to have our voice honored while also honoring the other voices out there and sort of making spaces for community. Um, so anyway, so I, I just wanted to share that because it, it was a really inspiring thing for me. And um, yeah, it's the same reason that I'm so happy to be here with you all, um, you know, sharing this connection, which has been the basic nutrient of life for me. So I like, I just, I'm glad to be around people who create, who honor that creation um, and treat that connection like it matters. So yeah, that's the hokiest, most maudlin ending ever. <laughs> <laughs>